Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> we um, have a lot to cover in 35, 40 minutes, so let us move with unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, and majestic instancy to, uh, to talk about how naturalists actually help make the case for God's existence. I think this is going to be a very helpful uh, tool for us as we engage with the, quote, secular mind. So uh, let's, uh, let's begin. <clears throat> well, just uh, this is where we're going. We wanted to talk about the creeds of naturalism. We'll compare that to the creeds of theism. Uh, we'll look at the worldview landscape or vision of naturalism, which actually helps support belief in God. Uh, we'll look at what naturalists uh, actually say to help reinforce belief in God. So the creeds, contours, and claims uh, is what we'll be looking at. So we're going to talk about this. Um, uh, we're going to have something of a tenets match here, uh, the tenets of theism and naturalism. A little pun there for you, but uh, I guess it's not raising much of a racket here. All right, so anyway, I thought I'd court humor here, but uh, it's not working. Uh, anyway, the, <clears throat> so we'll talk about the uh, tenets of theism first, and then we'll look at naturalism and then the uh, incoherence, uh, indeed the counterintuitive nature of naturalism. So these are familiar to you. Uh, the tenets of theism. <clears throat> Thought a BBC might be a helpful mnemonic device. First of all, you know, you're familiar with this, a being of maximal greatness. Uh, again, not just a, a, a super powerful uh, being who creates us but could be evil. No, a, we're talking about a being who is worship worthy. Uh, we're also talking about the uh, one who is the bestower of the divine image that God creates human beings with the capacity to uh, not only, uh, well, with the capacity to relate to him, but also to reflect him uh, in various qualities that God himself has. And then thirdly, the C, the, that God is the creator of all other reality. Uh, so God creates a world distinct from himself. Uh, we're not talking about pantheism. We're not talking about monism. And it's helpful when people are saying, oh, I don't believe in God. Well, it might be good to ask them, well, what version of God do you happen to believe in? Uh, because I might not believe in that God either. So it's good to, good to be precise because a lot of people carry a lot of baggage and caricatures with them. So let's talk about the foreseeable implications of theism. The first C is the, the creation's beginning, that the universe came to existence a finite time ago. Uh, so there is, the universe is not eternal. There's a source that is independent of the universe that brought it into being. Then there's the cosmos' design, that it's bio-friendly, uh, that it's, you know, again, just the universe has to exist, that the universe also, in order for life to actually, you know, to get to Homo sapiens, uh, it has to be not only bio-friendly in that it's life-permitting, because you can have life-permitting universe, but it doesn't produce life. It also has to be life-producing. But even that in itself is not going to be adequate because you've got to get from that single-celled organism all the way to Homo sapiens. That's yet another huge leap. Uh, and again, we're just adding high improbability against, uh, you know, onto high improbability. Um, so that's, those are the two C's. The, here's the third C, the creator's personhood. That the universe and our own source, you know, you know, as human beings, that there is a personal being behind it all. Uh, that there is this, uh, you know, so, so we're not just talking about some cold cosmos out there, uh, products of stardust and all that. No, we are talking about a God who is guiding all of this process. And then the fourth C is the creature's dignity. Uh, we can talk about, you know, objective moral values and, and human dignity that aren't the product of valueless material processes, but they're in the endowment of an intrinsically uh, good being who has bestowed these upon us. So those are the four seeable implications of theism. Okay, then the tenets of naturalism. So we'll just again go through this uh, briefly, a me-centered view. So let's talk about uh, metaphysics. Um, and their view, you know, naturalism's view of reality is that matter is all that exists. So we have the first ism, if you will, uh, materialism, followed by, we talk about the etiology or causation 
You talk about the etiology of a disease, you're looking for the cause of that disease. So you know, all events are physically determined by prior physical events going all the way back to the Big Bang. So we can uh, refer to this as determinism. Determinism. And then finally, the, the uh, E of epistemology, the view of knowledge in naturalism, is that knowledge is only or best acquired through the scientific method, uh, known as scientism. So again, these are probably, you know, if you're familiar with naturalism at all, you kind of get a, have a general sense of what this is about. So, uh, so again, uh, I'm happy to send you this uh, PowerPoint, so just uh, if you can't get it all, fear not. But um, materialism, determinism, scientism. So what are the implications of naturalism? Um, well, we've got no supernatural, no soul, no self-determination, no signs and wonders or miracles, no survival after death, no significance to humans, no solution to the problem of evil. These are the sorts of things. The, uh, uh, you know, the, the implications of naturalism are pretty, pretty stark. In fact, Jaguan Kim says that if you're going to be a naturalist, grit your teeth, it's going to be tough, you're not going to like it. He says it's imperialistic, it demands full coverage and exacts a terribly high ontological price. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna be a naturalist, you know, don't play games with, don't tinker with theism stuff. No, you gotta, do, you gotta, be, you gotta, be, straight, determ, you gotta be straight determinist, straight materialist. Again, you know, all, you know, you know, scientism, that's all, very stark. So what are some initial problems with naturalism? Well, we can say that, first of all, it, there's incoherence here. For one thing, you know, when you're adopting materialism, how can you show that matter is all that exists? I mean, I mean, you can just posit it, say, yeah, matter is all that exists, but you know, why are you kind of closed off from that? Some people call themselves free thinkers, uh, but they're materialists and they're not open to any sort of supernatural realm. I mean, how is that a free thinker? Uh, there, you know, it's a closed system here. Uh, there's determinism. How, you know, is the naturalist conclusion something she couldn't help believing? I mean, do you really, are you really holding to that determinism? Are you going to be really that consistent? You know, you, you can call, you can say, you, you may be happen to be right, but it's just lucky that you're right because you had no control over your beliefs. So, I mean, how is that going to advance your, your cause? Uh, why do you think your view is more rational than the, than the theists? You can't, both of you can't help believing what you do. And then thirdly, scientism. How can you scientifically prove that all knowledge must be scientifically provable? You see, at each of its three tenets, you've got fundamental problems. You've got some incoherence issues that need to be addressed. So problem two, it's counterintuitive. Naturalism ultimately denies what's so obvious and fundamental to us as human beings. Oh, what are some of those things? Well, we'll talk about those in a bit, but uh, let me just say something about uh, another version of naturalism. Uh, Wilfred Sellers, uh, who, you know, he, he, uh, he, he wrote a book that was a bestseller. No, I'm kidding. Um, but he did talk about the scientific image versus the manifest image. Now, the scientific image is what we saw Jaguan Kim talking about the strict reductionistic naturalism, that humans are nothing more than valueless, deterministically driven molecules in motion. I mean, fundamentally, that's what we're left with, um, that humans don't have this intrinsic dignity and worth and so forth. That's the scientific image. If you're gonna follow science, that's what you're left with. But there are some people who uh, want to be, want to, you know, hold on to their naturalism, but yet, they want a kind of a softer naturalism, a more palatable naturalism, <clears throat> which is called a broad naturalism or the manifest image, the things that seem so obvious to us, things that seem so apparent to us. That's the manifest image. That human beings, oh, we're much more than molecules in motion. We're self-conscious, valuable, morally responsible, duty-bound, purpose-seeking beings. But again, according to the strict naturalist, all of that is an illusion. You know, that's not, you're not truly following science. 
You know, for all the praise you're making of science, you're not being consistent here. And I think that fundamentally, the broad naturalism is going to collapse into this strict naturalism, which again is grim and unsustainable philosophically. But again, we'll, 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 we'll track this. So here, here's, here's to illustrate our point. John Searle, he is telling us about the manifest image here. So, uh, using, you know, so, so he says there is exactly one overriding question in contemporary philosophy. How do we fit in? How can we square the self-conception of ourselves as mindful, meaning creating, or meaning discovering perhaps, uh, free, rational, etc., agents with a universe that consists entirely of mindless, meaningless, unfree, non-rational, brute, physical particles? Yeah, big question. You see the clash of the manifest image and the scientific image. Well, what, how does John Searle answer it? Here he goes. Physical events can have only physical explanations, and consciousness is not physical, so consciousness plays no explanatory role whatsoever. If, for example, you think you ate because you're consciously hungry, or got married because you're consciously in love with your prospective spouse, or withdrew your hand from the flame because you consciously felt the pain, or spoke up at a meeting because you consciously disagreed with the main speaker, you are mistaken in every case. In each case, the effect was a physical event and therefore must have an entirely physical explanation. So that is how he goes about this task. Um, the man, you know, he rejects the manifest image. It's, it's hollow. No, this is what you're stuck with, pal. Deal with it. All right, so here's, we've got something of the, uh, uh, the unnaturalness of naturalism. Uh, there, there's a kind of a, a three self movement here within naturalism. Uh, you're probably familiar with the three self movement in China. You know, churches being self sufficient, self propagating, self governing, et cetera. You know, so, you know, these sorts of things. Um, but uh, you, know, you have the self evidence problem. Why should we deny? as human beings, what seems so obvious to us, you know, that, that my choices make a difference, that, that, I, have, you know, that, I, that uh, I have dignity and worth, uh, that, I, you know, that beauty, uh, you know, it, it, strikes, it, it really strikes me, it, it faces me, I can't deny beauty around me and so forth. Why should I deny what seems so obvious? Also, the self-delusion problem. You know, a lot of people will say, oh, it's just you know, the blind watchmaker thesis, that what looks like purpose is actually just an illusion of purpose. Well, how do we know that that's illusory? I mean, how do you, you know, you know, and furthermore, the self-exception problem. People like Richard Dawkins and Michael Ruse and others, they're often making themselves the, ex to the exception to the rule that they believe everyone else is under. I can tell that morality is a corporate illusion, Michael Ruse says, but the rest of you, you, you really don't get that. But I get it, you know, I'm able to rise above that, that, that illusion uh, question. Um, and so, so purpose, the appearance of purpose and rationality and, and morality and so forth. You know, again, how do they know that? How do they rise above to make themselves the exception to what everybody else is subject to? And how do you prove scientifically that it's just an appearance and not actually design or actually you know, objective morality and so forth? Science isn't gonna help us there. That's a philosophical or a theological judgment. So here we go. Contours, the worldview landscape, or the vision of naturalism that supports belief in God. So what we want to do is look, kind of step back and look at the furniture, as it were, of naturalism and theism and see what is the most likely outcome given this backdrop. So here we go. Uh, so the criteria, how do we assess which worldview or theory to prefer? Are we just favoring our own theistic bias? You know, that, that, you know and kind of rigging the game in favor of theism and it looks like you're, you're really not being fair to the, uh, to the, the other worldview. And then secondly, the co which context, naturalism or theism, makes the best sense of these various features in question, features about the universe, features about our own uh, human condition. So let's talk about, first of all, the criteria. How do we assess which worldview or theory to prefer rationally? So let's get to the nub of the issue here. So, when comparing naturalism and theism, which worldview picture is more natural, unifying, and basic? And I think that these are not arbitrary criteria. These are ones that we utilize in our everyday judgments, we utilize in scientific work and so forth. It's not as though this is somehow rigged in favor of theism. So let's, uh, let's unpack these a bit. First, 
uh, the natural criterion. Uh, given naturalism and theism, which features of the universe and human experience will more naturally, least surprisingly, more probably emerge? You see how, how this is working? Let's look at the context, the metaphysical furniture, and see you know, what is the most likely outcome here, given those two worldviews. Uh, here's the, uh, you know, Eric Wielenberg of DePaul University. He says, he was actually responding to an essay that I wrote, um, where I said, from valuelessness, valuelessness comes. He said, from valuelessness, value, value sometimes comes. Well, why think that? That's wishful thinking. He's just being so optimistic that, oh, some, somehow value could emerge out of these valueless uh, conditions. Well, you know, the theist doesn't have to play that game. Theist says, no, if, if there's a supremely valuable being, well, value is, yeah, value is a, a highly probable outcome in this, uh, in this uh, finite world. Okay, so, uh, you know, theism is the more natural explanation or the more natural backdrop there. What about what is more unifying? Does the theory or worldview in question bring greater coherence, interconnection, or unity? Uh, and so what about the very disparate phenomena like the beginning and the fine tuning of the universe? Consciousness, rationality, beauty, free will, human dignity, those things that we take for granted about our own you know, human you know, understanding. Well, Eric, you know, let's talk uh, about Eric Wielenberg again. He says that there are pre-existing eternal moral facts prior to the emergence of moral values, that is, with the emergence of, you know, through evolution of morally valuable beings who are morally responsible, who have moral duties, and those duties, you know, resemble those facts that have been eternally existent. Well, I mean, isn't that interesting? You have human beings that emerge on the scene, but yet their own moral framework corresponds to those moral facts perfectly. What? Well, that's quite a leap. I mean, it's as though those values were, those, those facts were anticipating our arrival. You know, and so, you know, but that's just a cosmic accident, it turns out to be. I mean, what a, by what lucky chance did we have that, wow, those eternal facts have been waiting for us to come. We happen to correspond with them. Well, again, with the theist, you don't have to play those sorts of games. There's no, no accident here. Uh, it's all integrated. It's all, it all fits together. It's unified. So Wielenberg must move in the direction of the transcendent. Notice he's, he's talking about some sort of a realm beyond the natural world, these preexistent moral facts. Well, we're kind of on our way toward talking about God, aren't we? So he wants to keep the transcendent to anchor moral values, or, uh, but, but again, he, or to the, have those moral facts. But again, he doesn't have the, again, he can't argue from a naturalistic worldview. So he's got to go kind of non-naturalistic on us. Um, so again, uh, you know, theism is the more apparent option here, the unity of a valuable being creating valuable humans. And so it resolves this theism evading dance that Eric Wielenberg is engaging in. So, so again, uh, you know, so the third criterion, which is more basic. Well, the, the feature in question is, is it just there, like this brute fact, just accept it? Or can a worldview offer a deeper explanation than others? And if it can, then that's the worldview that we ought to be more seriously considering. So here's how this can work, say, with regard to Bertrand Russell and Copleston, Frederick Copleston, uh, in their famous BBC debate. Frederick Copleston asked about the cause of the finite universe, and Bertrand Russell, the atheist, replied, I should say that the universe is just there, and that's all. Well, you know, to say that it's just there, what if you could offer a deeper explanation? I mean, the universe did begin to exist a finite time ago. Can't we take a step back and say, well, okay, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Theism has some sort of a basis for affirming this. If matter, energy, space, and time began to exist, then some independent cause brought the universe into being. Some people, of course, will say, yeah, well, where did God come from then? Well, then we're not talking about God anymore. If you're talking about everything needing a cause, then that presumes atheism. No theist maintains that everything has to have a cause, but everything that begins to exist has a cause. God did not begin to exist. Some people say, oh, you're kind of rigging that game. You know, you're, you're making it sound like, oh, there's, you know, well, 200 years ago, atheists, believed that the universe was self-existent and self-explanatory. But now that God seems to be a likely candidate here for the beginning of the universe uh, as a cause, now they're saying, oh, well, what caused that? No, there's nothing philosophical problem, philosophically problematic about saying that something always has been there. 
In fact, unless you believe that something can come into existence uncaused out of nothing, then you have to maintain that something was always there. You see that? Because being cannot come from non-being. If you just have nothing, how could something ex you know, pop into existence? Something always had to be there. Okay, let's talk about the context now. We've talked about some of the criteria, let's talk about the context. Which context makes the best sense of the features in question? Well, basically, I'll just I'm have to speed along here, but uh, the existence of consciousness, beauty, free will, personhood, rationality, duties, and human value. The things that we take for granted, kind of commonsensical things about our own human uh, you know, awareness and condition, not to mention the beginning of the fine tuning of the universe, hardly surprising if a good, personal, rational, creative, powerful, and wise God exists. But these phenomena are quite startling if they're the result of deterministic, valueless, non-conscious, non-rational material processes. All right, do you get that? So now let's talk about our, uh, you know, the naturalists um, who, you know, we can call them here our philosophical friends, comrades in arms. Uh, like the Beatles, I get by with a little help from my friends, we can get by with a little help from our naturalistic friends to help reinforce the explanatory power of theism. So let's talk about this briefly. How do nat so we've got basically, you see, we've got a context of you know, c comparing theism and naturalism. Theism anticipates these sorts of things that we take for granted as human beings about free will, about even the problem of evil, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know things that we can talk about with regard to you know, consciousness and rationality and, and human dignity, all, all these things, that whole package. So, uh, you know, and what we can do is build on that now by saying, well, look at what naturalists themselves have to say about these sorts of phenomena. And I, over the years, I've accumulated tons of quotations from naturalists who help to, again, reinforce the point. I'm just giving you a sampling here, but I've got, uh, you know, 30, 40, page, or 40 or so pages of these sorts of quotations in, in these various categories. So let's talk about this. So, so we have the heavens declaring the glory of God. Well, we can also affirm that the scientific naturalists are declaring the glory of God as well. So let's talk about existence, mere existence, and uh, also the beginning of the universe. So let's talk about uh, here the beginning of the universe. Uh, again, I'm just only quoting naturalists here. <clears throat> uh, our new picture of the universe is more akin to the traditional metaphysical picture of creation out of nothing, for it predicts a definite beginning to events in time, indeed to defin a definite beginning to time itself. And they ask what preceded the event called the Big Bang? The answer to our question is simple, nothing. Well, well, you know, thanks very much for re reinforcing the solidity of theism's starting points here. Here you're going from nothing to something. But, but being has to come from, you know, if it begins to exist, it's got to come from being. It can't come from non-being. Again, theism here is very much in the driver's seat in terms of explanatory power. William Rowe acknowledges that the emergence of the Big Bang Theory of the origin of the universe has given new weight to an argument for the existence of some sort of creator. Yeah, indeed. Makes sense, it fits. Michael Roos, now here he's talking about just sheer existence. He says, this is a pretty remarkable state of affairs that we have here, planets, suns, organisms, humans, and so forth. Why is there any of it? Why is there something rather than nothing? This question is not about the Big Bang or if anything went before. It is about the very fact of existence. One doesn't expect something like this with its astounding interdependency and innumerable complex parts functioning in service of the whole to just happen. Preach it, brother. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, it doesn't just happen. Theism makes a lot better sense of that than, uh, than the naturalistic worldview, that it just somehow happened, that things somehow exist, contingent things somehow exist. Consciousness, again, we see the same sort of thing going on. The emergence of consciousness then is a mystery, one to which materialism signally fails to provide an answer. Again, you see that common, commonality of not being able to provide an answer for how consciousness could emerge. Uh, Colin McGinn, uh, you know, how did this, you know, again, when we talk about consciousness, seems like a radical novelty in the universe, not prefigured by the after effects of the Big Bang. So how did it contrive to spring into being from what preceded it? So how did it convert the, the, uh, the water of biological tissue into the wine of consciousness? Again, uh, Theus doesn't have problems here. He's got a context for consciousness. Again, Jaguan Kim, how could you know, this, you know, this, uh, these electrical currents blossom into conscious experience? Again, baffling for the, you know, baffling for the, uh, the naturalist. 
Uh, here's, a, here's a fun one. Atheist Thomas Nagel criticizing atheist Daniel Dennett uh, in his denial of consciousness. Uh, so Daniel Dennett denies <clears throat> that there is such a thing as consciousness, that this is part of folk psychology. He says, you may well ask how consciousness can be an illusion, Thomas Nagel says, since every illusion is itself a conscious experience. <laughs> so it cannot appear to me that I am conscious, though I am not. The reality of my own consciousness is the one thing I cannot be deluded about. The view of Dennett is so unnatural that it is hard to convey. I'm reminded of the Marx Brothers line, who are you going to believe, me or your lion eyes? <laughs> Dennett asks us to turn our backs on what is glaringly obvious. All right, you, you, you catching this? We've got some friends, folks. We've got some friends in the naturalistic camp. Free will and moral responsibility. Again, Thomas Nagel, uh, there's no room for agency in a world of neural impulses, chemical reactions, and bone and muscle movements. I mean, they're giving it to us straight. Uh, rationality. Um, you know, notice that it is just blind luck if the human science forming capacity uh, happens to yield a result that conforms more or less to the truth of the world. It is largely a lucky accident that there is such a partial convergence. You know, if, if you happen to get it right, that's just lucky. Uh, you know, it's not as though the, there's rationality that is involved here. Uh, Richard Rorty, every speech, thought, theory, poem, composition, and philosophy will turn out to be completely predictable in purely naturalistic terms, including what Richard Rorty just wrote there. That that is, predict, per, that is predictable in purely naturalistic terms. So he's not saying anything of interest. It's just he's just parroting what these, these molecules in motion are uh, forcing him to say and think and write. Objective moral values. Joel Marx, I've given up morality altogether. In a word, this philosopher has long been laboring under an exam unexamined assumption, namely that there's such a thing as right and wrong. Now I believe there isn't. Atheism implies amorality, and since I'm an atheist, I must therefore embrace amorality. No, it's just dealing straight. He tried to play games with Immanuel Kant, and that just didn't work. He just saw that it, that was being inconsistent. Couldn't hang on to his atheism and be moral. Um, so the religious fundamentalists are correct. Without God, there is no morality. Hence, I believe, yeah, so there, there you go. Kai Nielsen, we have not been able to show reason requires a moral point of view. Reason doesn't decide here. The picture I've painted for you is not a pleasant one. Reflection on it depresses me. The point is this, pure practical reason, even with a good knowledge of the facts, will not take you to morality. Thank you, Kai Nielsen. You're telling us what we as theists already know. J.L. Mackey, uh, moral properties are so odd that they're most unlikely that, you know, that they're most unlikely to have arisen in the ordinary course of events without an, I would say, not all powerful necessarily, but you know, all, you know, supremely, valu supremely valuable being uh, to create them or to be the source of them. So teleology, uh, there's purposiveness uh, evidenced in nature, uh, in the universe and in biological organisms. And so I thought I would throw that uh, porpoise in there to talk about porpoisefulness. Um, so, um, all right, so I just want to make sure that you're tracking with me here. All right, so, so let's talk about a few of these things. The fine tuning of the universe, again, uh, you know, the, again, naturalists here, if they were, you know, the, the constants in the universe were altered by only modest amounts, the universe would be qualitatively different in most cases, unsuited for the development of life. Uh, you know, there's extreme fine tuning, uh, the, the startling coincidences in the precise details of physical law. I mean, the theist has no problem here. It, it's, uh, it's no surprise if there is a, a wise, uh, powerful God out there. The universe and its laws appear to have design that is both tailor-made to support us and if we are to exist, leaves little room for alteration. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Uh, even in biological organisms, uh, Richard Dawkins, the machine code of the genes is uncannily computer-like. Biologists, here's how, how do you like this by Francis Crick. Sounds like Romans chapter one. A biologist must constantly keep in mind, that is, they must suppress the truth, that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. <laughs> Um, so there's no guidance here. It's just strictly uh, you know, random evolution here. Uh, Francis Crick, however, talked about the origin of life that appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. I mean, that's the closest they'll get to the supernatural. But again, uh, it takes a lot to get life from non-living matter. In fact, if they could actually replicate how life could be produced from non-life, it would just show that it takes a lot of intelligent planning, doesn't it? 
Okay, so we can go on and on. Here's a kind of a, another comment. Um, Timothy Lenoir, not a, again, all, all these are naturalists. Teleological thinking has been steadfastly resisted by modern biology, and yet in nearly every area of research, biologists are hard-pressed to find language that does not impute purposiveness to living forms. You know, we'll often use these analogies like oh, the eye is like a camera, or the brain is like a computer, or the cell is like a, a factory. You know, it's just remarkable how these anal analogies are being brought in to explain how things work in science, and again, using this design language to do so. Alvin Plantinga. The basic idea is that such fine tuning is not at all surprising. This is a theist, by the way. Uh, but he's reinforcing our point that all, you know, he says, not at all surprising or improbable on theism. God presumably would want there to be life and indeed intelligent life with which or whom to communicate and share love. Given atheism, it is surprising. Therefore, theism is to be prepared, pre preferred to atheism. All right, here's another, go back to the, back to, back to the atheist now. Anthony O'Hear, uh, in experiencing beauty, we feel ourselves to be in contact with a deeper reality than the everyday. Aesthetic experience seems to produce the harmony between us and the world that, that, that would have to point to a religious resolution, were it not to be an illusion. No, there's that illusion again. How do you know it's an illusion? Uh, he concludes, from my point of view, it is above all an, an, an aesthetic experience. Our nature transcends our Darwinian origin in tantalizing ways. And then here's the Nobel Prize winner, uh, Steven Weinberg. Sometimes nature seems more beautiful than strictly necessary. <laughs> Yeah, so thanks, uh, uh, thanks for putting it that way. Okay, human uniqueness even. Richard Dawkins, we have the power to defy the selfish genes of our birth. This is an advance for Richard Dawkins. Uh, he says, we alone on earth can rebel against the tyranny of the selfish replicators. So there's a, this chasm between us and say the, uh, the, the great apes. Um, Daniel Dennett, like other animals, we have built-in desires to reproduce and do pretty much whatever it takes to achieve this goal, but we also have creeds and the ability to transcend our genetic imperatives. This fact makes us different. Sounds like the image of God here, doesn't it? Okay, so and we can also talk about how you know, the, the most fundamental things to us as human beings, these existential concerns about purpose and meaning, you know, as well as things like self-awareness, morality, duty, you know, rationality, you know, experiencing guilt and shame, the sense of brokenness that we have, the need to repair what is broken, the need for forgiveness, the longing for transcendence and so forth, you know, even encountering evil and injustice, which presuppose a way things ought to be. These are the sorts of things that fit very well into a theistic framework, but again, hard to square with the scientism and materialism that has left us with this disenchanted world in which we live. You see, what is a problem for many scientific naturalists and atheists is just not a problem for theists. For one thing, there is, and we've got the AAA club here, there is, a, there is an acknowledgement, an honest acknowledgement of the seeming inconsistency between naturalism and the phenomenon in question that we've just kind of gone through, rational, rationality and so forth. But there's no inconsistency for the theist here. Also, there is an astonishment. There's often utter astonishment at these phenomena in question. How could consciousness emerge out of you know, soggy gray matter? You know, that's just so you know, baffling. Well, again, for the theist, there's a context for consciousness, a supremely self-aware being. Um, and then appropriation. Often, atheists will appropriate language in the furniture from the theistic universe. That's the, that's the manifest image. They'll often borrow, oh yeah, human beings have rights, human beings have dignity, human beings you know, can appreciate beauty and so forth. Well, yeah, but they're, they're really reaching into the theistic uh, you know, tool, tool bag, as it were, and borrowing a lot of those things to you know, get along in their own worldview. Otherwise, it would be an unlivable worldview, wouldn't it? That stark, you know, that, that imperialistic, high ontological price that you've got to pay to be a consistent, strict naturalist, as Jaguan Kim pointed out. 